Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I'm Peter Gross, co-host of the original Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler. For more than 50 years, Wild Kingdom explored wildlife and our natural world. Tonight's episode and many others focus on the timeless value of wildlife conservation. Wild Kingdom played a critical role in changing public attitudes about the importance of animals for the health of our planet and our own quality of life. We challenge viewers to learn about animals and get involved in conservation in their local communities. That call to action resulted in more visits to local zoos, nature preserves, and even observing animals in their natural habitats. And that connection with animals benefits all of us in the wild kingdom. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom right here on RFD-TV. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Mutual of Omaha. Hello. Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. The turtle has a long-standing reputation for being a real slowpoke. So it may surprise you to hear that some turtles can move faster than you can. Not this fellow. He's a land turtle, a starred tortoise from India. And with his hard shell to protect him, he doesn't have to move fast. But a sea turtle has to be able to escape from enemies to survive. This is a baby green sea turtle. And when he grows up, he'll weigh 400 pounds and be able to swim 20 miles an hour. That's about four times as fast as a man can swim and faster than most of us can run. In our travels around the world, Jim Fowler and I have set many kinds of animals against the clock to time their speeds. And to see who some of the champions are, we started a chart. We can group these animals according to how fast they swim, run, or fly. Of course, the fastest animals on the chart are the ones that rely on speed to catch their food or to escape from their enemies. One of the best methods of clocking these animals is with the speedometer of an automobile. And this is the method that I used in clocking a variety of animals at Wanky National Park in Rhodesia. I had joined a game catching expedition and was just beginning to relax when our lookout man signaled that animals were nearby. A herd of sable antelopes had moved out onto the open pan. And this is what we're waiting for. The park rangers wanted to capture a few to be transplanted to another area. Chasing an antelope and putting a noose around its neck is not easy to do. But it was a good opportunity for me to clock the animals. Because in trying to get away from us, they'd be going at top speed. The sable is one of the most stately of antelopes. With its noble head drawn back, it runs with all the style of a champion racehorse. He's up to 40 miles an hour and still pulling away. It isn't easy to lasso a moving target when you're running at that speed over rough ground. Now our position is right, and there goes the rope. Here's one sable that's going to have a new home. Across the pan, we had another opportunity to run a speed trial. Here's a magnificent Elan bull. And although he's the biggest of all antelopes, he's no slowpoke. 
we timed him doing 40. Turning away from the elan, we really had to step on the gas to catch up with a couple of ostriches. They can't fly in the air, but they can really fly over the ground. At 50 miles an hour, a bird is one of the fastest of all land animals. When we caught sight of a herd of elephants, we had an idea of racing them against the clock. But a big bull didn't want to race. Just as our engine stalled, he came at us in a full charge. It was a narrow escape. He had hit us head on. And we all agreed to take the book's word for it that elephants travel at 25 miles an hour. The capture noose is standard equipment for game handlers throughout Africa. It was demonstrated for me by my friend Willie De Beer, who supplies animals to zoos around the world. Riding with Willie and his crew in the catching car gave me the opportunity to clock the animals they were chasing. The giraffe is undoubtedly the most spectacular runner in the wild kingdom. And if we're going to give a special award for style and form, here is the winner. That weaving head makes an elusive target for the noose. When he seemed to be going at top speed, and we were running even with him, I clocked him at about 30 miles an hour. Zebra, like giraffe, rely on speed to escape from lions and other predators. We paced them for some distance and found that they were running quite consistently at about 40 miles an hour and keeping up the pace. When we were satisfied with our timing, Willie's men made their catch. Breaking a zebra is like breaking a wild horse. The real work doesn't begin till after you've roped him. While I was in Wanky National Park, I wanted to time an odd animal called a spring hare. I needed a pole and a noose to catch one. Game warden John Stead worked with me on the experiment. I had learned from the bushman that the way to catch a spring hare is to shove the noose down its burrow and twist it around to snare him. You need a lot of determination to catch a spring hare. And I was lucky. But what a curious animal. It looks like a cross between a kangaroo and a rabbit. Completely nocturnal, it has short front legs and sharp claws for digging, and long hind legs and feet for jumping. In order to time his speed, we moved to a flat area. John held him while I measured off a course of seven paces, or approximately 30 feet. All right, Mr. Springhair, on your mark, get set, go. In slow motion, you can see why he's called a Springhair. One and a half seconds to travel 30 feet. That's about 14 miles an hour. And that's fast enough to escape a lot of pursuers, including us.
An automobile speedometer is useful for clocking animals in open country, but sometimes you have to use other methods, such as timing an animal with a stopwatch as it covers a measured distance. That's how Jim timed the spring hare. And that's how I measured the pace of several interesting animals on a visit to the Alberta Game Farm in Canada. Before the speed trials began, I enjoyed getting acquainted with one of the participants, a bear cub. We had set his cage 50 yards from a tree which I knew he would make a run for when released. The idea was to time him as he made the run. Our producer Don Meyer stood ready with a stopwatch as I opened the cage. I chased after the bear to keep him going at high speed. He covered that 50 yards in nine seconds. His father could do better, but it still works out at just under 12 miles an hour. And that's not bad for a little fellow. The camera provides a reliable record of an animal's speed over a measured course. We clocked the kangaroo at 25 miles an hour although they've been reported to go much faster. A black buck antelope galloped down our course doing nearly 50, a real speedster. From a helicopter over Yellowstone National Park, I watched a coyote trying to escape from us. Plowing through the deep snow, he was really pouring it on. On a fast track, chasing a jackrabbit, a coyote can streak along at 45 miles an hour. And even here, the pilot and I estimated his speed at better than 30. When I was at the Boy Scout Ranch at Philmont, rangers of the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish invited me to go along and help take account of the pronghorn antelopes in the area. It was also an opportunity to check out the speed of the fastest runner in America. Although the pronghorn is not a true antelope, it runs like an antelope, reaching speeds that leave its enemies far behind. I don't think these animals were going full speed, but from our airspeed indicator, we calculated they were still doing well over 50 miles an hour. Our chart's beginning to fill in, Marlon, and I think it shows now that there's a definite relationship between the speed at which an animal runs and the structure of its legs and feet. Man is not a very fast runner because our legs and feet simply aren't built for it. We're plantigrade, and that means that we walk on the soles of our feet like this. Yes, so are bears and so are baboons, and we're all lagging pretty far behind in the race. But now the foot of the coyote's a little bit different. That's right. He walks on the ball of his foot, and this gives him more leverage so that he can run a little bit faster. But the hoofed animals have gone a step further. They've actually risen to the tips of their toes, and they're walking on their toenails. That includes the pronghorn antelope and the African antelope, among others. And they're all champions on the land. But what about the water? Our sea turtle shares it with a lot of fast swimmers. One of the most interesting is the manta ray, and we were able to set one of these against the clock in the waters of the Bahamas. It happened while we were out with our friends of the Miami Seaquarium to capture porpoises. From the crow's nest, I spotted a manta ray, and we bore down on it. This giant of the ocean, also known as a devil ray, measures up to 20 feet across. When we were running even, we clocked him flying through the water at 14 miles an hour. A much more famous swimmer is that delightful creature, the porpoise. This is Keiki, a young porpoise working in the interest of science at the Oceanic Institute in Oahu, Hawaii. Keiki has been thoroughly conditioned to obey the commands of his trainers. Now he's transferred from the pool to a boat for a trip out to sea. 
we were privileged to photograph Keiki here in a research project directed by Dr. Kenneth Norris of the University of California at Los Angeles. Dr. Norris seeks an answer to that much debated question, how fast can a porpoise swim? The speed trials are run from a submerged wire cage along a 350 yard course calibrated and marked with buoys. Keiki goes into the cage to spend the night. The next morning he has a light breakfast before the race. A surfboard equipped with an underwater loudspeaker is set in the water. This is what the porpoise has been trained to chase. Now the porpoise is a social animal. When Keiki was captured, he was taken from a school of some 80 porpoises. If he were left alone, he might become dejected and even stop eating. So his trainers provide the needed companionship, swimming with him and petting him. The surfboard is pulled up near the cage. Its speaker is turned on and the cage is opened. Keiki has been conditioned to respond to the sound, knowing it means he will ultimately be rewarded with fish if he does what is expected of him. For a while, he's allowed to play freely around the surfboard, getting reacquainted with it. To him, it has become something like a familiar toy. Beneath the surfboard, the loudspeaker emits the chirping signal that reminds Keiki of his final reward. Now it's time for the speed trial. Down the course goes the boat towing the surfboard, with Keiki in hot pursuit. Naval experts and zoologists alike want to know more about the amazing porpoise, how he can move through the water without leaving a wake, and whether or not he really can travel 30 and even 35 miles an hour, as many sailors have reported. Swimming the calibrated course, Keiki has not yet attained any such speed. In repeated tests, his best time has been 19 miles an hour. For him, though, the race is won if, before passing the 15th and last marker, he overtakes the surfboard. Time will tell whether or not he can go faster. Meanwhile, one thing is entirely predictable. He'll certainly go for his fish. So far, our Wild Kingdom track meet has included land and water events. But what about those animals that fly? Around the world, geese are famous for flying great distances and at great heights. Airplane pilots and mountaineers have seen them over the Himalayas at 29,000 feet. At the Alberta Game Farm, we had the opportunity to time the flight of the Canada Goose. We measured a 100-yard course with Don Meyer out at the finish line. Jack Richards was behind the camera. Bill McKay was our dispatcher and the contestants were more than ready to fly. I started the watch as we made a trial run to be sure the goose would fly naturally down our course. And that I could see the flag to stop the watch. Then we were ready for a real test. From a slow start, the goose covered the 100 yards in five seconds. That's 40 miles an hour. So in free flight, I'm sure he could live up to his reputation for going 55 to 60. In Idaho, the Snake River cuts through a canyon that we call the Valley of Eagles. Nesting along the cliffs, golden eagles are concentrated here in greater numbers than anywhere else. 
When Jim and I saw one land on a cliff and settle down, we figured its nest was nearby, and it would probably stay there long enough for us to get set up to check out its flying speed. It was worth a try anyway. Our pole net trap is baited with a live chipmunk. He's tied to a string so we can pull him out to lure the eagle down from the cliff. The chipmunk isn't really in danger because just as the eagle swoops in after him, I'll raise the net between the eagle and its prey. The chipmunk will escape into his box and the eagle, I hope, will get tangled in the net. We'll keep in touch by radio. Marlin will climb the cliff and post himself where he can see the eagle as it takes off. And he'll give me the word to start timing the flight. I'll be hiding in the blind beside the net. Now we're set. Marlin's in place on top of the cliff. The eagle is still there. And I'm in the blind. We've established radio contact and Marlin says for me to pull out the chipmunk and get ready to start timing. It takes keen eyes to spot a chipmunk from way up on that cliff, but that's the kind of eyesight an eagle has. He sees the chipmunk all right, and Marlin says he's about to take off. Twenty seconds. As I removed him from the net, he let me know in no uncertain terms that he didn't think much of our experiment. Marlin and I calculated the distance he had flown to be a half a mile. He had averaged an amazing 100 miles an hour. He's done his day's work, and now he's free again to ride the winds of the Valley of Eagles. There seems no doubt that being streamlined for travel through the air with a minimum of friction gives birds the right combination to break all speed records. In our travels, Jim and I have had the opportunity to time many of the world's fastest animals. Comparing notes, we find that our champions are in the water, the porpoise, on land, the antelopes and the ostrich, in the air, the falcon. The cheetah has been clocked at speeds of 70 miles an hour. He's the real champion on land. But the falcon, at 180 miles per hour, remains the grand champion of all. All these animals, and many others, are from the day they're born set in a continuing race against the clock. For predators and their quarry alike, speed is not a matter of sport, but a basic element of survival. And only so long as an animal continues to win every race does it survive the fierce competition it faces in the wild kingdom. <laughs> The company with health insurance for people of all ages has presented Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. For help. Like what you saw? 
Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube for more exclusive content. And visit our website at wildkingdom.com. Mutual of Omaha. Protect your kingdom.